Prosperity Stock Report delivers you digital insight. Digital insight into what's happening behind the scenes with Canada's most promising publicly traded companies, exciting startups, and the deal makers that keep stock markets flowing. So get ready for our next unscripted interview. And now, here's your host, Derek Ivany. Guys, welcome back to the Prosperity Stock Report official podcast. I'm pretty pumped up today. Our FGD pick hit a all-time high and essentially yielded a 100% plus gain for our subscribers. So another success in the bag. Um, we're working on a couple of pretty exciting deals right now. You know, we're doing the whole due diligence process and all that kind of stuff. So hopefully we're going to have something fresh for you guys uh, in the next couple of weeks. But um, in the meantime, today, we're going to interview one of my favorite dudes in the world of business. His name is Dan Blondell. He's the CEO of Nano One Materials. I'm pretty excited to have you on the podcast. You know, um, are you, are you okay. familiar with the term fanboy? Fanboy. I've heard the term fanboy, yes. Well, I just, I just learned this term from my eight-year-old son so, who thinks he's 16. So basically, it means a male fan who can barely keep their composure. So... I'll try to oh, my okay. best to maintain mine because you know I'm a I'm a Dan fan here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, that's uh, I'm not sure what to, to make of that, but I'll uh, I'll take that for now. Yes, thank you. Well, it was when we had those uh, Chezwan chilies at Momofuku. I knew when you and I stepped up to the plate, and everybody else was yep. playing it safe. You're a risk taker, and and I knew we were onto something at at that point. Well, we both done some time in Vietnam and had a, I think a little bit of uh, uh, a little bit of spicy food in our gullet from time to time. So yeah, and, it's, uh, uh, it's something you never really lose. No, I know. And have you had any more uh, spicy experiences since our last meal there? Yes, at, uh, I, yeah, I did. I went uh, went out for some great uh, Mexican food in Vancouver last last weekend. Actually, a place I've never been. So. Um, and uh, it was complemented by some really good uh, mezcal margaritas. So, oh, that uh, sounds good. That's def- definitely going to go back to that place. I'm having a tea right now, unrelated, but yeah. I've uh, kicked my hundred a day espresso habit to to these different teas. So I'm actually having a nice Assam tea from India. Oh, you know what? I'm uh, I'm I'm still uh, I still can't kick the coffee habit. Well, I, you know, I'm so. still having the coffee as well, but. Um, I'm definitely having more tea. Good. We have this thing, David's Tea in Ontario. I don't know if it, is that in BC. Yeah, you know, it? it, you know, it's all over. It's all over Vancouver as well. Is it blowing up over there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's everywhere. We've got one. Uh, we got a local Chinese uh, grocery store that I go into, and it, there's a David's Tea kind of implanted right in it. So, is it blowing up like Hasbro in the board game industry? Yeah, isn't that something? Hey. I, I was telling there you, you guys at that meeting, I said, you know what? The board game industry is, is overtaking video games with growth, and this is where I want to be. And, and I've, I've been watching this trend for years. And, yeah. and in fact, when I come to Vancouver on the 27th, I'm going to have to bring you a Tesla versus Edison War of the Currents game. I think you're going to like that one. But you're going to have to confirm with your son uh, whether or not uh, he's heard of it or if it uh, meets your uh, you know, playlist. War of the Currents. Oh, well, I, 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 I certainly haven't heard of it, but I will. Uh, I'll bounce that off him. He'll, he'll probably do a little research and figure, figure out something. Is it, is a new game or it's an old game or what? Uh, it's, uh, it's not that new, but it, you know, it has a really high rating. So if you go to boardgamegeek.com, it's kind of where you know board games are given their rating and playability, and it's, it's, it's pretty decent. And um, you know, it's kind of in your alley, so I figured that would be a, a good one to bring you. But uh, I know you guys okay. like the, the worker placement style games and your son's into more of the fantasy stuff. Have you guys had any more board game talk since our last encounter? Um, a, a little bit. He, there was a game he asked me about um, right at the end of our con- when I was uh, when I came home. And I, did, I never sent you the information on it, but I'll, I'll have to look it up. Inside of you. But, uh, yeah, he was, uh, he was keen to know if you'd heard of it. There was one game that he, he threw at me, I think, when we were having a discussion called Globetrotters. And he said, did I stump him on that one? And I said, I, I can't remember if he'd ever heard of Globetrotters. Yeah, but, no, I have it. And it's, it, a, it's a good game. Um, we, well, we inherited it from, from like a family closet, you know, and it's kind of, I think we played it like one or two times, but it, uh, I think we played it with someone who didn't have any patience, so we never really got through it the first time. If I recall, it's a pretty big uh, box, isn't it? Yeah, it's a big box. And it has like a it's kind a of like a, like a bluish metallic style globe kind of thing in the middle. 
Yeah, yeah, and you and you, uh, uh, you know, I think you're a travel agent or something like that. And you, uh, it's it's been probably five or six years since I played it, but and I, the game's got to come from the '70s. I would say. Yeah, it, it's the game's old, but the the artwork for the game kind of looks a little bit more futuristic for that time period. Yeah. Yeah, and you know it's got uh, it, it's, it's in the in the days of uh, high flying stewardesses and stuff like that. So it's got that, if I remember correctly, it's got that kind of feel to it, like the uh, uh, you know at the at the, the zenith of the of the airline industry in the you know the late seventies, early eighties kind of. He'll be excited to hear that you had heard of it, although he'll be, he'll, uh, be a little dismayed that he didn't stump you. I said, but I, you know, he's gonna have a hard time stumping him. Yeah, no problem. I'm waiting for, I'm waiting for that. But keep bringing it. Hey, Dad, yeah. you went to UBC back in the day, right? I did. Yes. What was the game that you used to play when you were in university? What game? Well, I played Hearts in university. Like the card game? So we're not a board game, but we had the Hearts. Hearts was a big, big game. So uh, I had a whole bunch of buddies, and we would play at lunch, and we played. Uh, play when we go on road trips. Hearts was the game. Were you born there, or no? I was born in Montreal, actually. Oh, really? I didn't know that. Uh, I was born in Chateau Guy. I lived in Point Claire and Beaconsfield, and uh, my my family moved out of there when I was eleven. So you're fluent uh, I went in French school. Then? Yeah, I went, well, I went to French school. I was fluent in French. Let's put it that way. But it uh, it does come back. That was my first educated language. Although my my I come from an Anglophone family. That was uh, that was back before any of those language laws got put in place. So. Where is the Blondell name from? Blondell is an Icelandic name. Blondell. It's got two little dots on top of the O when you uh, when you spell it in Icelandic. Oh, okay. And and it's uh, there's a little there's a little uh, there's a there's a river in northern Iceland called the Blanda, and the Blondell means uh, from the valley of the river Blanda. And that and there's a little there's a little farmhouse there with a much longer version of my name called Blundos Dals Dal, Dal, Dollar or something like that. And it uh, uh, it's kind of where they it's where the, the family spawned from. So they they left a long time ago in the 1800s. Well, they spawned some good but, roots. I I recently yes. did a ancestry DNA kit. I was able to discover aside from my Irish English slash German background, I actually have a bit of Viking in me. Ah, excellent. Actually, well, you know, the Vikings were they were uh, they were busy out there, so I'm sure they put themselves in a lot of people. Have you lived in any other countries? I've traveled a bunch, um, but I have never uh, really lived in another country. So uh, it's mostly been Canada, of course. Uh, I've spent a lot of time in Asia. Uh, my wife and I did a did a trip to Vietnam, China, Mongolia, Russia. Uh, all the way clear across to the Atlantic and uh, in England, but through the Scandinavian countries and back home. And that was kind of a, you know, a year, probably 14, 16 months long. And um, uh, it's kind of where I cut my teeth in, in uh, opening my mind to, to to different cultures and stuff like that. And you know, I'm going to have to get into that because Nick, who gracefully introduced us from Cantech, and yes. that was an excellent conference, by the way. Um, you know, he, he said that we got to talk about that story. But before we get into that, you also mentioned last time that your son is, was did you say he was studying in China and, and actually his course load's going to be in Chinese? Uh, well, he's not there yet, but yes, that is, uh, that's what's going to happen. So he's in a, he's in a program that is uh, at Simon Fraser University here in Vancouver. It's a dual degree program. So he basically does uh, half his degree at SFU here in Vancouver and half of it in China at a university just south of, of uh, Shanghai. And that will be done in Mandarin. So he's, he's, he's studying computer science and math, but uh, he's also doing a crash course right now in Mandarin. So very intensive course because when he lands there in May, uh, well, when he lands there in May, he's do, do a bunch more language training by September. He's got to be fluent enough to, to learn in Mandarin. That's impressive. And how yeah. old's your boy? He's 18. Uh, yeah, 18. Yeah, he'll be 18. 19 in, in, uh, uh, in May. And mine's eight. So basically, I think I'm going to have to prepare him to be a future Dan Jr. fanboy because I'm sure well, you, it's going to be you know what? You, part of the future you, you, of Canadian uh, innovation, that's for sure. Well, you've done a lot of things, Derek, and, uh, and uh, you know, he'll see that. And he'll, uh, you know, I, 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 you know, he's our, our kid's kind of cautious, uh, but I think the one thing uh, he's he's not afraid of culture, language. He's not afraid of learning, and that's largely because my, you know, my wife and I have spent a lot of time uh, around the world, and I think that's, you know, that's part, partly made it uh, possible for him to even dream of, you know, think of doing something like this. Uh, and and you've certainly, you've certainly uh, have 
uh, a very high risk tolerance and you can be out there doing things. So I'm sure your kid will, it'll wear off on him. Well, he definitely has a high risk tolerance when it comes to uh, some of the sporting things he tries to do. But speaking of you and your wife, we have to talk about the yep. Mongolia story. You guys decide to trek across Mongolia for 40 days. Yeah, it was not, it's not quite across Mongolia because it's a long way. Mongolia is like the fifth largest country in the world. No, we, we, what we did my, is my wife's dream to go horseback riding in Mongolia. We kind of ventured off on this this Asian trip uh, with a sort of a glimmer of, a, of an idea how to do it, um, and uh, it was when we were in Hanoi in Vietnam that we we learned it was easy to get a visa there at the time, and we we did that. Uh, we landed in Mongolia five months later uh, with a visa in hand, and we went out and found a found someone to train us in uh, in the Mongolian language. We found somebody to train some UN workers, and we got a smattering of Mongolian, and headed off into the hinterland to find someone to rent us horses. And eventually, we ended up uh, in the in the part of the northern part of um, uh, Mongolia at a place called Hovskol Lake. Uh, it's this lake that's very up near the Russian border, and uh, the local uh, park warden there. Um, had I don't know twenty or thirty horses of his own, and uh, he came out and came. He basically rented us horses and came along for the first ten days of our trip, and then we cast us on our own for thirty days. So we spent thirty days on horseback, and um, you know, after sort of being trained and trusted on his horses, uh, and and uh, off we went. We never really got far very you know every day, but it was uh, it was a massive adventure. We were, you know, sometimes we stayed with locals. Sometimes we were neck deep in mud and in passes. Uh, we certainly we got lost every single day. It was, uh, it was and stunning. you got a horse stuck in the mud. You got a horse stuck in the mud uh, more than once. And how they, deep was that? Oh, there were times where the horse was kind of right up to its neck in mud or in uh, or we fell into a, a kind of a weird. Uh, geological feature where the we were up on the ground and the horse tried to jump across what looked like a creek and it was six feet deep and uh, and fell into the into the creek with the horse and then then it was quite a process trying to get a horse out of a out of a uh, situation like that they tend to freeze up and uh, that's how they go into kind of this panic mode and you have to coerce them out uh, uh, quite violently to get them out of that situation otherwise it just won't move. I guess your UBC uh, background in engineering helped. <laughs> I can tell you, I mean, my my background in engineering might have attracted my wife. I don't know. It's my wife that helped. She's the uh, she was very good with horses. She spent some time with thoroughbreds as a kid in in uh, uh, in uh, in the states, and that uh, that prepared her very well for that. So I, I give her full credit uh, for dealing with the horses. Because it wasn't, it was definitely outside of my comfort zone, and I learned a lot on the way. But it was really her that uh, managed them. What do you eat when you're out there in the middle of nowhere in the wilderness of Mongolia? That's a very good question because so we we had already been kind of on the road for probably about eight or nine months when we got to Mongolia, and so we came out of China with nothing much more than a. Uh, uh, a couple jars of peanut butter uh, um, as any kind of specialty food. So when we got there, we had to do it like the Mongolians do it. And that is basically, uh, you take mutton with you. So that's grown sheep. And uh, and it doesn't, uh, it's not something you can buy in the supermarket. You have to actually go buy a sheep and slaughter it. And so we did that twice on our trip um, uh, because we, we went basically through two sheep's worth of food. And um, uh, we didn't do the slaughtering on our own, but we were, uh, you know, the person, the people we bought the sheep from uh, helped us, uh, you know, do the slaughtering. We helped them do the slaughtering. But it was a matter of, you know, we had to slaughter them, skin them, uh, cut the meat up into little slivers, and we had to dry it out every night in the tent with us, you know, side by side. That's incredible. Was, <laughs> yeah. So how old were you yeah. when you were doing that? Twenty-seven. Uh, 27. Yeah, I was probably 27. Yeah, 27 years old, and then um, uh, it was uh, yeah. Certainly, I'd never quite done anything like that. I've done a lot of outdoor, a lot of outdoor trekking in my life, a lot of camping, a lot of hiking, a lot of backcountry skiing, uh, winter camping, stuff like that. But I've never, I've never kind of shared that experience with a horse. Um, uh, very, very different experience. Very hard work. Uh, 
you know, there were times when we got up in the morning, the horses had been spooked and they disappeared and we had to go find them. And they were never very far, but um, it's not easy to find horses when they uh, when they're out of sight. And you made it all the way to the Russian border. We made it all the way to the Russian border where there's, uh, we were actually, we were trying to get to see the reindeer herders up in northern Mongolia. And they, and they, uh, they were rumored to have a camp um, up, up, up near the Russian border. And we got there and they broke in camp literally, you know, a day or two before because there were still, still a couple of smoldering embers and things like that. And they'd gone off to wherever their next uh, camp was. They tend, to, they tend to be, these tribes up there tend to be nomadic. They'll have... Uh, Three or four camps that they go to throughout the year, and they rotate through them every year. But anyways, we didn't see them, but we did run. We did run into some uh, Mongolian border guards with Kalashnikovs, and and uh, they weren't very happy to see us up there. That's and good. they, uh, at threat of taking away our passports, they redirected us, and, and uh, we went on our merry way southward and and uh, uh, avoided any kind of trouble with them. But they were they were never really. Uh, yeah, they're never really physically threatening, but uh, uh, I think uh, when someone's got a someone's got a gun like that, and you're uh, you're they've got their fingers on your passport, uh, uh, it's pretty easy to do their backing. And this is exactly why I've been promoting you to my other podcast guests because I don't know anybody else that can tell stories like this. But from all the the places you've been in the world, do you have a favorite country? Oh, I think Mongolia would probably be it. Um, just simply because it was like it's kind of it was like going back 400 years. I mean, it was a it was a wild, it was such a, such a wild place when we were out. You know, we stayed in people's yurts. We got to uh, we spent uh, we spent days sometimes uh, with people as they they'd go out hunting and come back with a with a wild pig or a deer, or or we were eating marmots off their off uh, off their that they'd shot on their in the, in the local hills. Um, so uh, there's so much kind of festivity and, uh, uh, and, and celebration and so much of it around the horses and the livestock and, and everything they value. Uh, we just had such a tremendous time. I, you know, you know, I've seen a lot of places, but the, the memories from that are, are probably the most vivid. Uh, uh, it's hard to imagine a lot of experience anything quite vi- as vivid as that. After you go through this, um, world travel expedition you come back to vancouver yeah. and is that when you got started in uh, the corporate world yeah you know i i'd done some uh, i'd already uh, done a little time before that as an engineer working in the, in the mining consulting uh, arena and then i'd done some medical device manufacturing that was my first that was my first taste in a startup and then i uh, my wife and i that's where we met actually in a medical uh, device startup and uh uh, we left that to do this travel. We came back, and I started working for a company called uh, Creo, which is uh, at the time was probably about 300 people. So uh, it was beyond the startup stage, uh, but it grew to be 1,600 people in Vancouver. Uh, they went through a uh, an acquisition that brought the company to 6,000 in uh, around just around the sort of the whole dot com bubble. Um, uh, they rode through all of that and were taken out by Kodak in 2004 uh, for an enterprise value of, of um, uh, probably one one point two billion dollars. And uh, I was there for 14 years, and that's where I kind of cut my teeth in uh, product management, technology management, uh, and and really that that gap between. Uh, the, the development of technology and sales. So I, I spent a lot of time with one foot in both categories. So, so very much on a on a technology marketing um, phase, and that's uh, that's where I learned to love the, the the story and the technology and and getting people you know enthusiastically involved in in technology. And prior to that, you did a little bit of work in the uh, regulatory affairs and environmental affairs arena. Yeah. Uh, oh yeah. Well, there's a. That actually came afterwards. Um, uh, okay. So when I left, I left Kodak in 2009, and I ended up at a company called General Fusion. Uh, General Fusion is, is a fascinating um, story, and uh, they are developing nuclear fusion technology. And I knew a lot of people there from my Creo days. So it was, in a way, it was a bit of a spinoff from Creo. A lot of really smart physicists and uh, engineers ended up there, and they uh, they needed someone to kind of look at the 
regulatory framework around uh, nuclear fusion. So what does it take to license uh, uh, you know, a fusion plant and all that kind of stuff? And it's not my certainly not my bailiwick. It's not my strength, uh, but I was a trusted resource. And uh, and I kind of went in there and worked with the senior man, the, the, the executive team to put all this together. And I, in, in, while I was there, I did a lot of other work on marketing and grant work. And, and, and um, still very close to those guys. But uh, the, the chance to start Nano One came up while I was there. And uh, I, uh, it was a chance to kind of really fully immerse myself uh, running a company. I'd never done it before. Um, but I had uh, I had a very good partner, John Lando, uh, who uh, continues to be my business partner on this. John comes from the public market side, he cut his teeth uh, trading on the floor in Vancouver when we had one, and uh, is just he's a very well respected, honest, hardworking guy in the uh, you know on the street level, and a bunch of experience at RBC Dominion. Um, so the two of us, you know, come together with a, with a solid market experience and, and, a, and a very good sort of, sort of general technology experience. So you and John yeah. get together, you formulate, I guess, Perfect Lithium, which subsequently becomes Nano One. Yes, correct. Yeah. And you guys connect to Paul Matisic or Matisic. Yeah. How do you say his, his last name? Matisic. Matisic. And yeah. obviously, for those that don't know who Paul is, um, he obviously is a uber successful mining guy, businessman, um, put together Uranium One, put together Potash One, sold them, made lots of money, and now we got Nano One. So is Nano One going to be the Triple Crown? Oh, it's actually, it, this, would be his, this would be his fifth win. Um, he's got four behind, he's got another, another couple. So he's got Uranium One, Potash One, Lithium One, uh, which was sold to Galaxy uh, a few years back. And uh, continues to be one of their uh, their most important assets. And then um, and then he had a copper uh, deal that he sold last year around this time as well. So uh, Paul continues to be able to he continues to have a really good nose for these things, and uh, and he's able to sort of put them together and build them up in in a, in a very short order. So uh, you know Paul's been a Paul's been a great asset to have. Uh, he's very well respected in the industry. He's put a lot of eyes on the stock, and uh, um, and and he, he continues to have sort of a very big uh, fan base. There's a lot of people who really uh, really like what he does. So uh, that's that's been super valuable to us. Right, and I I wasn't familiar with the lithium one, but I th- I think obviously it, it rings a bell now that you mention it. But I was I'm more familiar with lithium X, which is his current lithium deal. But, that's correct. Yes. So um, Nano One. You guys are in the energy storage business, but it seems though you guys are more focused on, I guess, what structured products. And does does this mean that no matter what, you can essentially tap into lithium or or vanadium or anything? Because you guys are essentially building a chemical assembly line or something like that. Yeah, actually, chemical assembly line is a great way to describe it. It's it's a it's processing technology, and for anyone in the in the mining space, um, you can, can kind of consider it. it's a little bit like mining processing, where we're taking raw materials like uh, lithium, nickel, manganese, and we're we're combining them, processing them into a mixed metal compound um, that uh, is useful for energy storage in this case. But it, we we could be doing we can be assembling any number of different products into uh, into a, a value-added uh, mixed metal compound uh, that has applications in it could have applications in many different markets. For now, we're focused on the lithium ion battery space because, uh, of course, it's, uh, it's it's got it's got a lot of legs. It's going to be around for a long time, and uh, and the growth potential is is rather large. So lithium ion battery space, but down the road you can be in 3d printing aerospace pharmaceuticals you you have a background in all kinds of different stuff so i'm sure you can open up all kinds of doors yeah yeah and you know it's a matter of getting when we as you move into these spaces it's a matter of bringing in the right kind of specialists that can help uh leverage the technology but but it's it's a platform that we have for for assembling these products listen we you know we fit just downstream of, of lithium mining and cobalt mining and manganese mining, um, these materials come out of the ground uh, and are processed, you know, in some way, shape, or form into sulfates or you know, chlorides or something like that. And eventually, they get upgraded to a to a material that um, uh, that would go to a 
go to someone in the in the lithium supply in the the battery supply chain who would convert it into a cathode material, which is an electrode material that stores the that allows you to store and discharge the lithium as you charge and discharge the battery. So as it as it goes through the uh, the oxidization process, it goes to that metal, and then over time, the more it charges, the more that metal gets weakened. Um, y- y- yeah, actually, so so what happens when you when you charge a battery? Um, you've got two side in a lithium ion battery. You've got two sides of the battery. You've got you've got cobalt or or nickel cobalt or some some mixture of of metals uh, that could include you know nickel manganese uh, variety of things. And then you've got graphite on the other side, which is the two electrodes. There's a separator that that keeps them from touching each other and shorting out. But essentially, uh, it's porous in nature. And as you charge and discharge the battery, you're stuffing lithium ions into the graphite structure. And as you discharge the battery, um, you, you change the uh, you change the charge in the nickel and manganese or cobalt on the other side, and that pulls the lithium over, and uh, and it gets kind of stuffed into the uh, atomic sort of matrix or the crystal matrix that's over on that side. And that's what happens when you charge and discharge the battery. Over time, those structures start to fall apart, and they hold less and less material, and that's why your batteries fade over time. At least that's one of the reasons why they fade. Now, when we refer to structured products, are those the structures that you're inventing different, um, I guess, combinations of metals around? Well, um, uh, we tend to focus on on um, structures that are already invented, so uh, and actually already used in batteries. See, there's we could be working on, let's say, the fundamental design of, of new structures or new uh, formulations of, of lithium ion materials, but they tend to take five, 10 years to bring to market. What we uh, believe is the, the, the right uh, approach or the right business approach for us is to focus on cutting edge materials. So that's the stuff that's going into batteries or is about to go into batteries because we're trying to improve the way they're made. We're trying to improve the cost structure of the of the of the process and trying to improve the cost structure of the raw materials uh, that get used in those uh, material in those battery materials, and and at the same time improve the the um, improve the the crystal structure, the lattice structure, the atomic structure within those uh, within in those materials to make uh, the charging and discharging more efficient. Right, and the guy running your lab, Stephen Campbell, he worked at Ballard Power Systems. It's a BC company. Yes, that's correct. And there's another gentleman there, Mr. Barton. He had a long yes. career there. And did he uh, work with Energizer? Uh, yes, he did. I believe he has done some work with Energizer. He's done some work in the batteries. Russell has the, is a man of uh, innumerable talents. Um, he has uh, He's probably got 30 plus patents in his name. If you count all the various international versions of, of, his, of his patents, he... Uh, he's touched a lot of different things, um, and includes batteries, includes fuel cells. He used to, uh, uh, he did a, a bunch of work on fish processing machines, um, uh, in his early days with Neptune technologies, uh, I think back in the seventies, early eighties before he went to, um, uh, Ballard, uh, and he's done work in cryogenics, um, uh, which is, you know, super cold things. Uh, Russell is is really a treasure trove of, of information, and uh, he knows uh, he just knows a ton about different things. He's a wonderful asset to have in the company, and and of course the experience on the electrochemical side with fuel cells and batteries um, helps helps tremendously as well. And you yourself also have some patents. I have some patents. Um, I, I uh, uh, they were. Those patents were developed, put together when I was at Creo and Kodak. Um, uh, as patents go, I, I wouldn't say they're uh, they were moonshots by any means, but they they helped build up our portfolio and, and give us a better position in in the markets they were serving. They're uh, they're kind of interesting ones, but I, I won't go into a lot of details. They have to do with color, and they have to do with tech that uh, printing techniques um, and the way you lay dots on on, on pieces of paper. Right. And so collectively, you guys have tremendous patent experience. Does Nano One have any of their own patents? Yeah. So we have three patents currently issued, and um, there's probably another 20 that are that are being prosecuted. And prosecuted means that we've 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 submitted them to the patent office, and they're reviewing them um, for for issues. Some of them are close cousins of others, and some of them are are completely unique. I think there's. Um, 
uh, I think there's eight or nine different unique uh, patent families that we're currently working on. Right, and I, I'm assuming that's where the addition of Joseph Guy fits in. Yeah, so Joseph Guy is uh, has been with us for quite a while. He, when we filed the first patent, he uh, which is in 20, March of 2013, he came on board as a, as a uh, uh, as an IP advisor and uh, and our IP our patent agent, uh, and he's been with us ever since. Uh, he's been fantastic. So you gotta... uh, he comes from the he comes from the chemical space. So he he actually worked at um, uh, Oak Ridge National Labs, and he also worked at Dupont. Uh, he's a PhD uh, 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 chemist himself, um, so he understands the space very, very well. And uh, and he's got uh, he's got he's got a bunch of years of, of both academic and industrial experience to bring to the table. And now and now, of course, he does nothing but just patents um, for uh, for a wide variety of clients in the material space. You have the science side taken care of. You have the business side taken care of with Paul. You have the legal side taken care of with guy that that's a incredible yep. recipe for success yeah and and then and then that's not just to, to the short sell my business partner john lando on the market side yes know, and john yeah he, uh, he uh, yeah he, he undersells himself many times but you know he's, he's got uh he's got a nose and he knows the street uh, uh as as good as anyone really in canada he's he's quite remarkable and and he's got a very good reputation he's trusted um uh, and he builds he builds long lasting relationships with the people that you know go and go into deals with him, and that uh, that goes a long long way. Yesterday I interviewed Alan Wilson. He's the CEO of Jericho Oil, and one of yep. Alan's largest investors is actually the Breen Trust, which is Ed Breen is the uh, I guess the CEO of Dupont. So it's a small world, but the theme was investing with billionaires, and that's the whole concept of, of the people that are part of Jericho as four billionaires involved. And your theme is investing along Paul, and not to you know trump uh, John, but there's there's definitely there's a theme going on, and that's pretty exciting. And I'm sure John's a great guy as well. So is John the guy who brought Paul to the table then? Yeah, I mean, Paul came to the table through the when we did the reverse takeover. So uh, the RTO uh, was uh, we've ended it into into Paul's shell, and uh, with John and I, um, uh, you know, we, we he had seen the deal before, and then when when it became obvious that uh, that the shell was the right vehicle, we approached him and asked him to stay on as as a chairman, and and he did. That's awesome. So he he liked the deal. He liked the people, and uh, and that's you know that's certainly a a big part of it. We also have another sort of big shareholder in this deal, and that's Keith Newmeyer, who's uh, who's the guy behind First Majestic, and and um, he was he came in as part of the the reverse takeover as well. He's been a very supportive uh, member, uh, you know, shareholder member in the in the company. And anyone who knows Keith knows uh, knows he's a very hard worker, and uh, and he's done some amazing things in the silver market. Yeah, Keith's a, a legend. Anybody in my business definitely knows who Keith is. When I look at the business model, um, I'm assuming that down the road, when when these processes are put together and the patents and everything are processed, th- is this going to be a licensing royalty type play? Yeah, that's that's always been our business model. Is that uh, we're developing the technology, uh, which is the patents and the intellectual property and the know-how and the people um, uh, to make it work. And we're developing the, the, Engineering package, which is the how do you how do you scale this up stuff up and build a, build a plant, and then we're out actively out there looking for partners who will license those two components, the engineering and the technology packages, um, uh, to build out a uh, a manufacturing plant. Uh, largely because you know, that's that's where their field of expertise is. Ours is in the incubating and the, and the developing of the technology. Theirs is in implementing it and and, uh, uh, and putting the supply chains and everything in place. Have you guys uh, built your own pilot plant to demonstrate the various technologies so, you're working on? Yeah. So the, so the pilot plant is uh, has been underway for the last six months, and we should have it uh, operational in March. So it's about a month, month and a month and a half away before we're we're operational in the pilot plant. And that, uh, as it stands, that uh, that'll give us the capability to demonstrate 10 kilogram uh, batches of material, and it would should it should seriously de-risk any doubts people have about the scalability of the technology, and it'll give us it'll give us enough material 
material that we can go out to some of the, you know, the big battery uh, players and uh, uh, and prototype the materials in, in, in some of their prototype batteries. It doesn't matter what variation of the market that's rolling, whether it be vanadium or manganese or lithium, there's a place for Nano One with everything. Yeah, I, I'm not sure vanadium quite fits in there, but there's uh, there's uh, it depends on the type of battery. But I would say most most materials in certainly all materials in the lithium ion battery space are materials that we can we can make. Uh, we can make some of the uh, the the ones that have been around for a long time. Lithium cobalt oxide. That's what's in the phone I'm talking to you on today. Um, lithium nickel manganese cobalt oxide, which is the material that's kind of finding its way into electric vehicles and uh, and such. Um, um, lithium iron phosphate, which is what's may what's going to find its way into a lot of the buses and, and the fleet systems around the world. Um, they're all different chemistries, and our process is kind of a one shot deal. We can kind of we can go we can make any one of these materials with this uh, with this. So it's we're quite flexible, and as market as markets as these markets emerge and trends change, we're uh, we're quite nimble. We're able to to shift uh, shift our focus a little bit and, and and deal with different materials. I've read, and you might have told me this before, but cobalt's getting more expensive as part of the battery process. Um, and you've figured out a way to, I guess, eliminate cobalt from the equation. How does that work? Yeah, so so uh, uh, of the we, we can make a, a variety of different materials, and uh, many of them have cobalt in them. Um, there's, there's one particular material that we've been working on um, uh, that's that's co- we call it a cobalt-free material. It's high voltage. It's it's a five volt. It's what's considered a five volt material, um, which isn't commercially available. So most of the batteries we we have in our phones are. Are maybe three and a half volts. Maybe uh, some of the stuff in the electric cars are pushing four volts. But as you start to push up to five volts, um, it, it gets to be quite an engineering and chemical challenge to run those batteries. One of the challenges is is making them the uh, the cathode material. And uh, this high voltage material happens to be cobalt free, and it happens to be one that's very uh, appealing uh, to the large battery manufacturers. So it's on everybody's roadmap. As a as a future battery technology, and uh, uh, we uh, we've heard since, since we have announced work on this material and our ability to make it, um, in, uh, we've had we've been hearing from strategics kind of all around the world over the last six months, and uh, there's a strong interest in in working collaboratively towards making some of these five volt batteries where we would you know we'd be supplying one of the key components or one of the the key one of the key pieces of technology to make one of the key components in it so it's uh it's very attractive material and, and you know i think i think everyone is aware that uh, there's a lot of demand for lithium and that uh four or five years out from now um there uh we're, we're gonna you know if we hit the demand curves um that the elected, the vehicle industry is predicting, um, where there's going to be quite a bit of supply constraint on lithium. Well, the same thing's going to happen with cobalt. Cobalt is a is a, a material that's 50% sourced out of uh, out of the Congo, and uh, it's certainly got its political uh, issues there. And I think at the same time, there are uh, um, there are supply issues just related to the mining of it. Um, typically, not mined on its own. It's mined as a result of copper and nickel mining. And we believe that uh, same we're on the same time frame, 2020 time frame. Uh, there's going to be a uh, fairly uh, uh, serious scramble to get a hold of cobalt. So if we can offer, you know, in, in our mix, if we can offer technology that that enables a cobalt-free material, that should have a lot of uh, attraction in the market. And and we already see that because we we already we're talking to the majors. It's on their it's on their strategic roadmaps. We know it's there. And it's there for you know for the high voltage reasons, and it's there for the uh, supply uh, the, the supply uh, or, or the supply chain risk reasons as well. And of all of the things that you're working on right now, what 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 are you most excited about? You know, I, I think my the things I'm most excited about uh, certainly as CEO of the company are, uh, are is the ability to to disrupt uh, the supply chain, now bring uh, bring a piece of technology to the market that will uh, integrate 
some of the uh, some of the work that's done at the cathode level and some of the work that's done at the mining level. And if we partner with the right person and we're talking to some some really interesting people in Asia right now, um, we think we can give them a, a, a really strong advantage in the supply chain, uh, being able to supply the market with a, with a cost-effective material that leverages uh, a wider range of, uh, of raw materials in the marketplace. So uh, what that means is using, using lithium that wouldn't necessarily get used in the battery space uh, or, or access or making materials that doesn't require cobalt. So changing the way uh, we, we uh, are demanding these materials and uh, we think we can, we can lower the cost of raw materials. We can lower the cost of production. We can make a better uh, effective material and we can give someone a very, uh, a very distinct advantage within the supply chain. And we think that can be quite disruptive. To me, that's the most exciting part is, is let's go out there and change the way these guys are, are making, are making these materials. After you build the pilot plant, let's say it's successful, you do demos, you show all the big battery guys what's going on, they want to make orders, and you're t it's time to scale. Where do you build the next scaled plant? Is it still in Canada or is it in Asia? I think the scaling is going to happen in Asia. I mean, in, in, unless things change dramatically, um, uh, all indications are that it's going to it's going to happen in Japan, it's going to happen in Korea, it's going to happen in China. Um, you know, may, maybe we'll start to see stuff move more into the southeast part of Asia. But uh, you know, those are where the big players are. That's where all the big moves are right now. Um, our, one of our one one person we didn't really talk about um, is Joe Lowry, who's a strategic advisor to Nano One. Um, Joe. Um, is known in the world of uh, lithium as Mr. Lithium, and he uh, he spent he's been selling lithium um, uh, for the last twenty twenty five years of his life. He spent a dozen years in China and living in China and Japan, selling lithium to uh, to cathode suppliers from basically all sources, all kinds of sources in the world. And he's he's super plugged in. He's highly sought after right now because there's a there's a scramble to get a hold of lithium assets and and to get uh, to get take off. Um, off take deals and and such in place, and Joe's brokering deals between you know large mines and 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 acquisitions, uh, and he's got his he's well positioned. He's probably better positioned than than almost anyone in the world right now in terms of his the relationships he has, uh, the trust he has with many of the, the cathode and lithium producers, and so we think Joe is is you know Joe's a place he's playing a big part in our in our strategy to go out and find one of these partners. And it's a bit of a long answer to your question because you were asking more about how well, what do we do once we get one of these partners. But I just wanted to first of all say that you know Joe's playing a you know, sort of a really essential role, and so he's, he's another part of the uh, of this amazing team that we've uh, we've managed to put together. There's another guy that we forgot to uh, include in the mix with everybody else here, and you mentioned what's his name? John was it? You know, Joe Joe Lowry is his name. Uh, Joe, um, yeah, I'd be kind of waiting for a. a, a a point to bring him in here because Joe Joe's a really important part of our team. He's, he's a strategic advisor to the company. We brought him on less than a year ago um, uh, because he he's known in the in the, the sort of the, the lithium supply chain or the battery supply chain as Mister Lithium. He's he spent twenty odd years, probably more than that, in in the lithium space. He spent a dozen years in China and Japan selling lithium to uh, to the battery producers and to, to grease producers and, and, and in all places in the lithium supply chain. But he, he knows the market and he knows the players probably better than, than anyone in the world right now. He's highly sought after by uh, by you know by the markets for advice. He's highly sought after by mining companies uh, to try and broker broker deals and offtake deals. Um, he's highly sought after by battery companies to try and get a hold of of, uh, of, um, of supply, basically to lock down supply for their uh, for their manufacturing facilities. And he, he's working with us very closely uh, with his uh, role decks and his his relationships to try and put together the kind of strategic deal that uh, that we need to have to take this to the next level. And that all comes together at the same time that we're we're building this pilot. The pilot's there to, to de-risk and demonstrate the scalability. Um, if we get one of these partners in place, um, it's not a big leap for us to move from the from the the pilot scale to a manufacturing scale. 
Right. Um, and, and and the 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 one of the reasons we're confident about that is is the the uh, we we have a um, we have another sort of partner on the engineering front, and they are a, a very world reputable engineering firm here in Vancouver uh, called Noram Engineering. And what they do uh, is they have a bunch of their own technology, but they build large chemical plants and they take them from concept through the pilot through the uh, full-scale facility. And they've done it many, many times in many different industries. Um, they've done some work in the in the lithium mining space. They've done work in sulfuric acid and nitrobenzene plants, and uh, they uh, they have a, a very strong reputation for being able to scale technology. And they are behind our pilot plant. And the partnership that we have together is really about continuing to work together all the way to sort of full scale manufacturing. So they they will certainly be our preferred choice at this point as a uh, um, as a, a supplier of the of the engineering services required to build this thing out. So our confidence level is very high, and I think uh, we've got a lot of the right uh, uh, pieces in place to to bring this to full scale. And how do you protect yourself with patents when you're doing business in Asia? Uh, you know, it, 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 when you're doing, it doesn't matter where you're doing business in the world. If you don't protect yourself properly with patents, someone's going to walk all over you. So um, it's the same strategy uh, in Asia as it is everywhere else, and that's you, you never stop patenting. So you, you put a patent out, um, and then you know uh, you keep reviewing it, you find ways to improve it, you spin out new patents, um, you continue working in the lab, you can continue generating new IP. So there's always stuff in the pipe that people don't know about. So they may be looking at your, your, your patent, and they may say, well, you know, uh, I think we can work around that. But they don't know, they don't know what else you have in the pipe. And if you don't have stuff in the pipe, they'll they'll eventually figure that out, and they'll they'll walk around your patents. And the key is is you surround your patents with deeper and deeper technology, and you and you surround it with mystery, so they don't know what you're patenting. And uh, by and large, anyone with a significant brand and uh, and a significant business, they're not they're not interested in in litigation. They're not interested in in uh, in. Uh, in dealing with uh, with patent lawyers and legal issues, they just want to get their business done, and uh, they reckon most of these most of the guys recognize that uh, that small companies like ours are the ones taking the chances that are more nimble and better able to make these kind of innovations, and they're the ones that are you know best able to execute and and, and commercialize them. So uh, you know, I, I think the Chinese players are no different. Um, you have to pick and choose them in China, but you have to do that elsewhere in the world as well. Does it get expensive? Um... With you know managing all these patents, uh, absolutely, uh, it's not cheap. Um, what tends to happen, I, and I've seen this before, you, you kind of get to a steady state where you're spending. You might be spending, you might be spending, you know, a couple's people's worth of money on patents. You know, every year, um, some of the patents which uh, you know you've improved on, you let them drop off the table, and some of them, and, and the important ones, you keep up. But it's key. It's it's what we're building. That's what we're selling at the end of the day. We're selling protection. We're selling the ability for someone to practice our technology and be protected from prosecution and uh, to carve a space up for themselves. If an investor is coming into Nano One now, what are the main catalysts to look forward to in the short term? Well, I think the in the, in the short term, you know, the, the first thing that's going to happen in, in the next month or two is we're going to the pilot's going to get plugged in and operating. Um, but uh, and, and that's something that uh, again, what that is 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 a demonstration that we're meeting our milestones that we're doing it, we're doing it on budget, um, and then we continue to hit our milestones. And I think that's uh, it's not a, it's not a catalyst per se, but it's uh, it's continued um, uh, you know verification that we're we're on the right path. The, I think the, the biggest catalyst we could see in the, in 2017 is some kind of uh, collaborative partnership on either on on next generation batteries or on uh, on manufacturing uh, materials at a larger scale. And we we fully expect that the pilot will precipitate that. We're we're already seeing that kind of interest from people. Um, it's just a matter of, uh, of of getting to the stage where it's operational. They can see it. They can see it de risked, and um, and they're willing to to take it to the next step, which would be some collaboration towards um, some kind of a licensing deal or joint venture or or, or uh, you know collaborative development program. Um, those are things that uh, we believe we'll be able to achieve in, uh, in 2017. So the pilot plant really opens the doors to all kinds of other possibilities, and that's more the longer-term horizon, but the short-term yeah, you know, is just steps away. Absolutely. Well, it's pretty absolutely. exciting then. Uh, you know, it's a great time to be a shareholder. I see that 
just in, since we last met to where we are now, the stock's up 20 cents already. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's performing remarkably well. We have uh, we have very good we have a very good shareholder base uh, right from the beginning. Uh, we've had guys in on this deal that are that are you know close to us. Um, they're all pros, uh, uh, you know, guys from from uh, RJ and uh, and Can Accord. Um, that have uh, have been there all along for us, and as we as we did the RTO, we brought more and more people in. We have a lot of very loyal shareholders who are out there supporting and and uh, and very much behind what we're doing, and, and certainly they're 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 very much enjoying the last few weeks. It's been uh, it's been a really good uh, it's it's been a really good ride, and, and uh, uh, you know we're we're working hard to keep it there, and, and we have certainly got our shareholders in mind um, as we move this thing forward. I have a big German audience. Uh, are you guys traded in Frankfurt? We are. So we're trading in Frankfurt um, under LBMB is the uh, uh, is the ticker, and we've had uh, we've had some we had some coverage there um, in 2016 uh, under some of the newsletter writers, and uh, um, shareholders can expect more coverage you know, moving forward as the as the pilot launches. Um, there'll be more news kind of um, um, channeled out through our sort of German. Uh, German uh, writers as well. Excellent. And you're also traded in the States. We are, yeah. So we, we listed on the OTC back in November uh, under NNOMF. And it's uh, that's uh, something that, uh, that a, a number of our, our people down in the States have been looking for. They wanted to, it, you know, you can, you can always buy stock in Canada, but it's way easier if it's traded down in the States. And this is. Uh, this has obviously made it e- much easier to put eyes on the stock, and, and it's probably you know, a big part of what uh, what's what's led to the um, uh, the current excitement about our, our, our about Nano One in the um, in the markets. Now I know it's not a mining play, not a traditional one by any means, but will you guys be at the PDAC? Um, so if, if, if we may be at the PDAC, not as a booth, but um, certainly it's a great opportunity to get around and talk to people in this in the market. So um, we haven't finalized that. There's a bunch of travel in other directions around the same time, so we're just trying to balance that out. But uh, it makes sense. We've been in past years, and um, uh, it's we're very close to mining. Uh, we're just downstream of it, and I think uh, certainly in the Canadian markets, it's something that uh, the mining industry guys can understand very well um, because it's uh, it's kind of like the upgrading or processing part of art of mining, in that um, something that I think most most people in the space can understand. If, at least if they've taken ever you know watched a watched a mine or a deal go right through to uh, past feasibility and into into some kind of uh, you know pre production. Uh, stage, um, and that's that's something that that most people can relate to. Well, if I don't see you in Vancouver at the end of the month, I do hope I can see you at the PDAC and buy you a beer. Yeah, well, I'm I, I'm I'm looking forward to playing War of Currents, so let's do that at the end of the month. We uh, could, it would be good to see you again. Thank you for taking your time to come on my show. I really appreciate it. I hope Nano One's going to be a tremendous success. Yeah, well, I, I really appreciate you uh, uh, having us on there and thinking that uh, you know it's a story your listeners want to want to hear. So. Um, and I and, uh, wish you all the success with this too as well. Let me know how I can you know, help you out as well. Thank you, Dan. It's my pleasure. And uh, let's uh, connect uh, at the end of the month. Okay, great. Cheers. Take, Take care. care. Have a nice evening. Do you like our show? Are you interested in learning more about our top stock picks? Visit us on the web at prosperitystockreport.com where you can join our free small cap newsletter and track our real-time portfolio live and discover how we continue to crush the street and the competition. Experience why we're one of Canada's most successful microcap newsletters today.